Well, good morning, everyone. Tell everyone good morning, Ja. Tell them we are in Wilmington, North Carolina today, and we are doing one of your dad's favorite movie locations from when he was a teenager. We're gonna do the filming locations of Empire Records. Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. Yes, as a crazy teenager, I also worked in an independent CD store, and so I think that was one of the reasons I love this movie so much. Plus it has a great cast, it has a great soundtrack, and when I moved to Hollywood, I lived in an apartment building and my upstairs neighbor ended up working for the director of this movie, Alan Moyle, and got to hear some of the stories behind it. So I'm really excited to go out and see some of these filming locations today. So let's roll. So we see this house when Gina, played by Renee Zellweger, comes to pick up Corey, played by Liv Tyler, and Corey is walking down this walk and says, surprise! and she is carrying cupcakes because she has made cupcakes for Rex Manning Day. And she says, even then, right out of the shoot, that daddy says there's 24 usable hours in every day, so you can already tell she's a daddy's girl. So they hop in Gina's car and drive off down this street. And that's when Corey, Liv Tyler, tells Gina that she plans that day on offering herself to Rex Manning, her teen heartthrob. Rex Manning is basically a David Cassidy type, um, older performer who used to be on a TV show and he was like the teen heartthrob on the show and he's now kind of considered washed up but he's out making a public appearance, doing a signing at their record store, and she's decided she wants to give him her virginity. So this was Corey's house. Even though a lot of the reviews said that this movie really wasn't that great, and they said that Renee Zellweger was the only saving grace because this was the first thing really anybody had ever seen her in, I actually think Liv Tyler was really kind of the star of this movie. I thought she showed a lot more depth and was really, really, really likable in this movie. Now we're heading down to the river walk where the store was, where Empire Records itself was. So believe it or not, that was Empire Records right there. They added a few little architectural things up there. They added that whole level right there where the band plays at the end of the movie. That wasn't actually there. And uh, where Lucas, where we see Lucas on his motorcycle meeting AJ and Mark is right over here in this alley. Let me tell you some secrets behind this filming location. So when we see Joe pull up, Joe actually pulls up and parks his car right here and AJ and Mark come around the corner because they just talked to Lucas. The secret to this is that they recreated this store, the inside of the store, on a sound stage. So when you see this, they always show kind of a distant shot like this, but then once they get closer, when you see Joe opening the doors or anything taking place inside the glass, that's when it cuts to the sound stage. So right here we see Lucas asleep on his motorcycle, face down, and AJ and Mark come to wake him up, and he wakes up and he says, something happened last night, Atlantic City. Mark says, did you win anything? And you can actually see this part of this building over his shoulder when he says that. They used to have a different yellow zigzaggy pattern that they've painted over, but that was right there. And Lucas says, no. So if they ask you, if it was nice knowing you, it was. I do not regret the things I did, only the things I do not do. And he rides his motorcycle out of here. And then we see Joe pull up in his car right there in front. The Empire Records established 1959 big neon sign would have been right up there. So this movie is basically about Lucas finding when he's first asked to close the store the night before, he sees that there's paperwork where they're gonna turn Empire Records into a music town, a conglomerate, 
chain store and he wants to stop this so he takes all the closing money for that night to Atlantic City, gambles it all, loses it all, and throughout this whole day in the movie, the manager Joe, played by Anthony LaPagli, is trying to figure out what he's going to do about the $9,000 that's now gone. Is he going to put his own money in and save the day there? But he wanted to use his money to make an offer to the owner of Empire and save Empire. So that's kind of what this is about. So during this day, he's trying to figure out what he's going to do. Lucas is basically, um, <laughs> they bring him back here and he is stuck to the couch. They tell him not to leave the couch and uh, it's Rex Manning Day. So while Rex Manning Day is happening, they have a shoplifter. They have Warren the shoplifter. Let me show you what happens here. So Lucas leaves the couch, but he brings one of the pillows with him. So he's not technically leaving the couch and he catches Warren shoplifting. And he says, oh, you have, it's a nice big jacket, nice big pockets. So Warren gets the hint and he tries to escape. He runs out this door. He comes running towards us and then goes down this alley. But the back of what they use for Empire is a different building. It's actually a building that's located down here. I'll take us to. Warren ends up going in the side entrance of the other building that we're going to see. Ends up coming back through the inside of the store and that's where Gina says, doesn't the shoplifter know you're supposed to leave the scene of the crime? He comes out this door again, and as he's coming out here, that's where Lucas is waiting for him right here at this parking meter. And then the chase ensues across the street, and it eventually ends up over in that parking lot over there. And that was where they had all the cars and everything staged. When you see them, we'll go over there. It was a parking lot even then that they staged it as like a car dealership. Hey, no passing. Save the empire. So here you can see that lot. So as uh, Warren and Lucas are running around this area, that's when um, Lucas ends up getting into the truck that's on the lift and he sees in the side mirror that Warren is coming up beside him. So he opens the door and uh, Warren runs into the door. That takes place right there. Then they take him back over to the store, which is right over there. And they take him back to the employee section while they wait for the cops to come get him. Kind of crazy to see how big this tree is now. This tree wasn't even here during filming. They filmed this in 1995. So, let's see how much it's changed in front of the Empire. They wouldn't even be able to have the stage that they put up here, that, that awning roof that the band plays on at the end. So in the making of this movie, they actually cut an entire hour out of this in the editing process. They cut out three entire characters, like, I'm not sure even how many scenes, but when they, in 2003, I believe, when they did a reissue of the movie, they added about 15 extra minutes, and you see more of Burko, played by Coyote Shivers. I used to be his neighbor, and he told me, he's like, yeah, there was a lot more scenes with me that were cut out. I never knew it. I was recently watching one of the reissues that they did and saw they put where he actually lives is right over here in the back of what they used for the back of Empire. So let's go find that. That's where the mural was that Mark kept kissing. Okay, so right here on the corner of Water and Muters, Empire would actually, the building we just left was right over there. This was the back. This is where, this is the back of the store. The Gloria Estefan mural would have been right there that Mark is up there kissing. And then the side was where the Motley Crew, Dr. Feelgood, and the Rod Stewart and everything was. And the way that you can tell that this is where it was is because, for one thing, that J.K. Brooks store, you can see that in the background when, uh, when Rex Manning is showing up, his car pulls right up here and they park right here and that's when he gets out and he's looking at the back of the store and he's complaining about it. You can see that. But you can also tell because Corey and Gina when they show up to work park right here. You can see that gate and everything in the background. And in the deleted scenes, before this little section 
was right over here. That's where Burko, they had a bunch of those shipping containers that people now live in. They had like a string of those and Burko, Coyote Shivers, lives in those. And so we see Deb riding her motor scooter around this side when she goes to enter. And all the employees, when we see them enter work, they enter from the side entrance, which is right, was right over here. And also what was right over here was that exterior staircase that when Lucas is chasing Warren, I'll flip around so you can get an idea. When Lucas is chasing Warren, we see Lucas jump down from it and then Warren goes the other way. That would have been the side of that building. So you would have seen the Rod Stewart and a couple other pictures over here. And it's sad too because the deleted scenes, I mean, there's a lot more to the story of the movie. There's a lot more to Joe and Jane's relationship in there, more to Corey's story. But it would have been basically right about here when after AJ tells Corey that he's in love with her and she kind of turns him down that she comes out to make peace with him and he snubs her and she eats that speed we find out that she is kind of like a speed freak so yeah even though the building's not here you can match up that building you can match up all this stuff the uh the little walkway gate and everything over here and then in one of the deleted scenes you can see the bridge over here i'll show you in the background yep you can see that back here so in the deleted scene when um, Deb is riding her moped around the corner, Burko actually sticks his head out and says, Deb, come here, let me talk. Let's talk about last night. That leads into, in the actual cut that we see of the movie when she shaves her head, that's all connected. She goes into the bathroom and shaves her head before work. She actually did that knowing that she was going to be filming the craft and filmed it, I guess basically, did that scene, shaved her head just a few weeks before she was supposed to work uh, on the craft, so they ended up having to put a wig on her for that. All right, we made it to Wrightsville Beach. You can see the water, the sand, the grass. This is where they filmed Say No More, Mone More. They set up that ridiculous canopy bed that he sings about in the video and they filmed it out here. Now what's crazy is that when they filmed it, they told the director of it, hey, we only need 17 seconds. They obviously wouldn't have used that side because of the building, so it been more like something like that. Told him we need 17 seconds for the movie and he filmed an entire video and gave it to him, so. Here's where it was all done. He's got that big ruffled, puffy, <laughs> like Seinfeld shirt. And so of course all the employees are making fun of the song. They're making fun of Rex the whole time he's there and everything to his face. And Corey does offer herself to Rex, but then chickens out. So Gina ends up sleeping with him in the countout room. So at the end of the movie, they realize they have to do something to save the Empire. Even though in the version that we saw, it all takes place in one day, the original filmed version takes place in two days. So I can only imagine what we're missing from that. But they ended up having to, like I told you, recreate or actually build this on here because that tree wasn't here at the time and what they played on wasn't there. So they built that on for that scene when Renee Zellweger, who plays Gina, tells them that her big fear is that she's afraid to perform in front of people and she wants to be in a band. So Burko has her perform. And so they do Sugar High right up here. Like I said, the high fidelity sign would have been up here and they would have performed all that right on that big stage up there. And then at the very end of the movie, it takes place on that roof because if you look at all the buildings around it, they all match up. You can see all the the nuances of the buildings. That's where AJ is up trying to fix the neon Empire Records established 1959 sign and Corey goes up and starts yelling at him saying that 
if he doesn't go to college he's stupid and that he shouldn't make his decisions based on her because she did love him and she does love him and she just didn't know it at the time and so he says Corey I'm going to art school so they have this big romantic kissing scene and then the end of the movie the entire crew of Empire Records is up there dancing on the roof so when Empire Records came out, it became a cult movie classic over time, but it was immediately a bomb. And when the script came out, there was a bidding war between studios to make it. And so Warner Brothers signed the rights and then two days later was offered Clueless, but had already signed on to do a teen comedy, so they didn't want to do it. In the end, they spent $10 million making Empire Records. Empire Records only made 300,000 at the box office. Clueless made 52 million. But who knows what the movie really was supposed to be? I mean, like I said, I met Alan Moyle and Alan Moyle said that it was supposed to be an hour longer. They cut out key scenes, key characters, but I love the movie. I love the soundtrack and I think it's a total time capsule of that era. I mean, I, th I think it just grabs 1995 and holds it there forever. So if you've never seen the movie, go watch it. It's really well acted and it's just an awesome movie. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time. Have a good night and goodbye.